Hello. Hello. Hello, welcome. All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the State of Lake Huron conference. My name is Ed Verhamey. I am the Vice President of the International Association for Great Lakes Research. And um, our committee's been planning this conference for about eight months now, so it's really great to see everyone here, to have the first round of technical talks behind us. Hopefully, folks are learning a lot of new things about Lake Huron um, and are talking to each other. It sounds like from the conversations uh, at the breaks that there's a lot of talking going on. So uh, we'll, we'll try and stay out of your way as, as much as we can. Um, please, please feel free to uh, talk to any of the conference organizers about your experience today. This, this conference series is one of five that Agler is hosting. Um, there's one every year on a different Great Lake. So uh, we're, we're really excited about this partnership and this opportunity to use the association's um, mission to convene um, about uh, the, the issues affecting each Great Lake. Um, and it's great to be here talking about Lake Huron. Uh, so we have the honor of having a uh, drumming group here today, and I'm going to have uh, Taylor Brook from the Saginaw Chippewa Indian Tribe introduce our drummers today. Um, I want to introduce our local Saginaw Chippewa drummers. Um, I asked Dan Jackson, who works with the tribe's seventh generation department, to do this traditional ceremony to honor Lake Huron and provide us with inspiration for our work. When I asked him, I offered um, sema or tobacco because that's the traditional offering when requesting a ceremony like this. Um, so I just wanted to say miigwech. Thank you for being here today.
All right, thank you. What a great, what a great welcome. Um, next, we have a unique opportunity to have uh, the folks in this room connected to um, folks at Clarkson University. And you know, one of the reasons that we're here today is, is, is really helping with uh, science policy transfer. So how do we help synthesize and, and talk about the issues affecting the lake? Um, so um, we have Michael Twiss, who is last year's president of IAGLER. And I don't see him on the camera, but I'm assuming that they're there. Uh, Michael, can you hear me OK? Uh, yes, I can, Ed. Thank you. OK, so uh, Michael Twist can introduce why he's on the phone and why we're hearing uh, his voice right now. All right, thank you, Ed. Um, and welcome to everyone out in uh, Saginaw, at Saginaw Valley State University for the State of the Lake Conference hosted by Agler. Um, as Ed mentioned, it's a really important time for uh, policy to meet with folks that do science. Uh, we're doing a similar event here in the sense that we brought together young adults from across New York State and province of Ontario, representing nine universities. And also we have an IAGLER uh, student board member here, uh, representing over 300 uh, members of IAGLER. <clears throat> what we're doing is we're meeting with the commissioners of the International Joint Commission. Um, and what they're doing is listening to young people's voices. Just like we heard the voice of that drum tells us a lot, we can hear a lot from the young people. And so at that point, I'd like to uh, um, ask Jean Corwin and uh, Pierre Ballon, who are the US and Canadian co-chairs of, of IAGLER, uh, to come to the podium and make an introduction and say hello to you. Thank you, Michael, very much. We'll have Pierre coming up too. He's wrestling with his jacket. <laughs> there we go. Good. Good. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you again. Yes. And uh, Pierre, good yes. to have you here as well. Yes. Uh, as Michael had pointed out, oh, Pierre and I are the co chairs of the International Joint Commission. Uh, we are a binational organization uh, that was created by the two governments to help solve the water disputes um, between our two countries. And we've been in existence since 1909. So clearly we're doing an excellent job at uh, present, preventing those disputes. Uh, but there are six of us, and uh, we have uh, three of our other commissioners here. I'm going to ask them to come up and so everyone can see them. Go. Uh, we have one member, or one commissioner, Marilyn Fair, who's from Winnipeg. She's un unable to join us today. Uh, she is in uh, Western Canada, but you guys can close as you can see. All right, great. Uh, we have here, uh, to my left, we have Henry Lickers. Uh, Henry is a member of the Mohawk Nation, lives in Akwesasne. He is our first uh, indigenous commissioner uh, in the, our 110 year history or so. Uh, so we are happy to have him. He's been instrumental in, uh, in bringing a lot of the indigenous uh, nation issues forward. We have Rob Sisson, who is our uh, Montana representative, who is also a Michigander. Uh, so he's got a lot of experience on the Great Lakes. And then we have Lance Yowie, who is uh, from North Dakota. And from here, I'll let Peter do the rest of the talking. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here, and it's great to be linked up with uh, people in Michigan, Saginaw Bay. Uh, I visited that area many years ago. Um, Michigan throughout is a great place to be, to live in, and to be exposed, uh, unfortunately, sometimes to some of the errors of the past and uh, but but i think a lot of things have been corrected and and we are here uh, and we have been visiting the basin uh, for the last over the last three months or so to talk to people to hear from people uh, what their views are on how the governments are doing what they are they have promised to do uh, through the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. And every three years or so, we go around the basin, choosing different places uh, every time. And uh, we are listening to you. And we're grateful because you're helping us uh, in our mandate to uh, advise governments on 
what they ought to be doing based on what we are hearing from you. So thank you very much. Was there anything else, Michael? Is that you guys signing off then? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Ed. Um, at this point, uh, it's, it's back to you, and we look forward to uh, the first plenary presentation at the conference. Great. Thank you. So, you know, there's 200, about 230 folks are convened here in Saginaw. We have um, folks from the International Joint Commission watching us as well. So, I, you know, before I introduce our plenary speaker, I just wanted to just, just remind folks of, again, how, how important their participation is here today, being able to talk about the issues affecting Lake Huron. Um, the, the International Association for Great Lakes Research uh, convenes an annual conference every year. Um, this, this coming year, in June of 2020, we will be in Winnipeg. Um, it's, it's a conference of about um, uh, 700 to 1,000 attendees, depending on where we, where we go. And so, you know, that's, that's a um, Great Lakes-wide uh, look at the issues affecting the Great Lakes and more on the science side. So with, with this State of the Lake meeting, we're really able to get down to the local level. We're, we're able to talk to the stakeholders. We're able to talk to the mayors. We're, we're able to talk to... Uh, folks in the community that are um, that are affected by the issues um, that are affecting Lake Huron every day. So it, you know the the attendance here is mostly non iagler members. So there's only maybe about a quarter of the folks in this room are are members of iagler. Um, so if if anyone is interested in learning more about the association, please. Um, stop and talk to Wendy Foster. She's the business manager. She has a table. There's some copies of the journal that the association publishes. Um, the journal is a fantastic resource for researchers and, and others. It just doesn't have to be science, talking about um, policy and economic analysis. And um, so if there's any uh, folks interested in that. And there's also a um, contingent of Agler board members here as well. So the board of directors met earlier this week, and you know we went through a strategic planning session, uh, really trying to understand how our um, organization helps convene meetings like this and, and have a meaningful contribution uh, to the Great Lakes community. So I do encourage folks to become a member of IAGLER. Um, it's a very rewarding experience. You'll get to meet people that are facing these same issues from across the Great Lakes. Um, so that was my Paul. Paul Sibley, the uh, current president of Agler, is sitting in the front row, just uh, making sure I get the plug in for membership. So, thumbs up from from Paul. So our guest speaker uh, or our plenary speaker today is is very much in line with the theme of this conference. And how do, how do we connect with the people that are are living and uh, that are impacted by the water quality issues and that are gonna be a party to restoring and, and protecting this resource. So um, Mr. Michael Kelly is the director of the Conservation Fund. Sorry, I'm just getting the, making sure I don't mess it up. Is the director of the Conservation Fund and their Great Lakes office uh, here in Bay City. So, um, you know, we're, we're really excited for, for him to talk. The, they held a State of the Bay conference um, a few weeks ago. So we're, we're gonna hear more about that. But, you know, it's really those connections of um, hosting a local conference, getting people excited, telling them about what's happening, and then also being able to participate in conferences like this, where there's really specialists and experts from across, across the region, from across the US and, and Canada. Um, so with that, I'll ask Michael Kelly to come up and begin his plenary. And it looks like we have, we have plenty of time, so uh, feel free. Well, I can talk a lot. well yeah, the only, uh, Michael's the only thing between us and lunch, so. 
No pressure. No pressure. All right, thank you. Thank you, sir. Yep. Well, thank you, folks. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Agler for the opportunity to come in and speak with you this morning. Um, and really to, to bring this conference um, to the Saginaw Bay watershed and to uh, Saginaw Valley State University. I'm a, a proud alum of Saginaw Valley State University, and as you've no doubt have seen if you've wandered around, this is an absolutely uh, beautiful facility, um, certainly on par with um, any of the, the greatest state universities in Michigan. Um, uh, in particular, the greatest Michigan State University. So, uh, well, I knew I'd get some snickers out of you. <laughs> um, but uh, th this conference, um, as I'd mentioned, follows on the heels of a, a conference that we had about a week and a half ago, um, the, the State of the Bay Conference. Um, we had about 200 people attend that. That's the second time we've done it. We did it back in 2017. And, and then again, um, this year, we're going to do it again in 2021. Um, many of the folks that were there are here, um, so a lot of our local folks and folks out of Lansing as well. Um, you're going to hear some, some presentations from those folks about some of the terrific things um, that are going on in Saginaw Bay. We have some presenters here, members of our steering committee team, um, members of the, uh, the public and some of the, the participants that were there. Um, it's been, uh, it's been you know, a, a great conference to have. I mean, much like this, being able to pull people together, practitioners that are out there um, getting things things done um, on the, the landscape. Um, I will tell you, um, it, it's a little intimidating um, coming up here after the tribal drumming ceremony. I don't think that I can uh, compete with that very well, um, but the tribe has been a terrific partner um, in a lot of the work that we've done here. And so thank you, Taylor, and the rest of the, the crew to, that came from the tribe. Um, to be with us here this afternoon. Um, I also know that I, I stand between you and, uh, and a late lunch. Early on, I thought that I was going to be your speaker during lunch, and so I thought, well, I don't have to prepare as much because you'll be eating. You won't listen to half of the things I say. And now uh, I had to go back through my presentation to make sure that every word made sense. Um, and I also know that you're very hungry. That's a, it's a late lunch, but you're going to be going over to um, the uh, uh, the Dow or the Doan Marketplace, uh, which when I went here was called the um, uh, Doan Cafeteria. Um, and I don't think universities even call them cafeterias anymore. I think when you go over there, you're going to find it's it's actually one of the greatest dining places in all of Saginaw County. It's uh, it's pretty spectacular. So. Um, I'm really um, thrilled that you're here today talking about Lake Huron. Um, there are some of us that have been working on Saginaw Bay issues for a long time. Um, and it's not just Saginaw Bay, it's Lake Huron. Sometimes we think that Lake Huron gets a little forgotten, and so it's great to have a crowd here uh, to talk about it. And I used to think it was just me, um, but I attended uh, a state of the Great Lakes, um, no, it was, it was the Great Lakes Restoration Conference in Buffalo a couple years ago, and I was in one of the sessions in um, we had an agency person there that was a moderator of the session, and I was sitting in the, the crowd. And we talked about, oh, sorry. Yeah. One technical note. No, web meetings. I just got to minimize this. Um, apologize. Okay. Just trying to give you more screen space there. <laughs> got it. Um, I was sitting in the, the crowd, and the, the moderator came in and talked about you know, how important the Great Lakes are. And, you know, in particular, um, you know, Lake Michigan and Lake Superior and Lake Erie and Lake Ontario and, you know, especially Lake St. Clair. And that's a true story. And, so, and maybe some of you were in the room when that happened. And I didn't correct them. I just thought this is par for the course. Um, you know, Lake Huron sometimes um, gets forgotten. And, and I dearly love Lake St. Clair. I'm a walleye and muskie fisherman. And so I'm down there a lot. And I fish for bass there. It's, um, certainly the, the second greatest fishery in all of the Great Lakes, next to Saginaw Bay. Um, but, uh, but it hasn't quite replaced Lake Huron yet as a Great Lake. I hope someday it will become a Great Lake, um, but until it does, hopefully we can keep uh, uh, Lake, Lake Huron in the, uh, in the lexicon. Just a, a little commercial to begin with. Um, I work for the Conservation Fund, which is a, a national nonprofit. We're based out of Washington, D.C. area. Um, some of you may have heard of us. Some of you probably haven't. Um, I have an annual report here, and I have a few other ones if you're interested in taking a look at that and learning more about um, what we do. Um, we're a, a top-rated nonprofit. Um, we work all across the country. Um, we're one of the only, probably the only still, um, nonprofits that chartered for both land conservation and economic development. Um, we learned early in the 1980s that um, 
you know, conservation and uh, economics don't have to be like two rivers that flow across the country that never meet. Um, they can be something, um, some things that do meet, and there's lots of opportunities to do great conservation while at the same time doing great ec economic development. Um, probably our claim to fame nationally has been uh, conservation of land, and in particular forest lands. And so um, at last count, we've conserved about 8 million acres um, in all 50 states. Um, I have yet um, to be the person that gets assigned to conser conserve land out in Hawaii, um, but I am uh, bargaining for that with, uh, with some of the folks at, uh, at our company right now. 96% um, of every dollar is devoted to programs. Um, just one more little thing you should know about the Conservation Fund, and maybe you've seen some of this news lately. Um, if not, I think there's an article coming out in Forbes over the next couple of weeks. Um, did something pretty unique. Um, we believe strongly that the future of land conservation is going to look a little different than it does today. Um, uh, it's going to be a lot more tied to working forests. Now, we certainly believe that protecting forest land um, for its values alone, it, its green infrastructure values, its ecosystem service values, um, is important. Um, but we also believe that you know, conserving forests by themselves um, often does not always relate to good economic developments. And forests are really important for communities. If you think about um, northern Minnesota, Wisconsin, um, the upper Midwest, the, the upper peninsula of Michigan, um, protecting these forests is really important, but it's also important to be able to harvest some of these forests, those communities. Those communities were built on these forests. Um, and so we floated a green bond. It's one of the first one that's ever, ones that's ever been done. We're raising $150 million from investors um, to really accelerate um, our conservation um, and the economic development um, of some of these forests. So um, look for more news on that, but that's, uh, that's pretty innovative, um, something that we've never done before and really hasn't been done quite, this, uh, quite the same way um, anywhere else in the country. I'm going to give you just kind of an overview of the Saginaw Bay watershed, and then we're going to dive into some of the projects that, uh, that we've been working on. It's a big place um, where you are right now. You're in Saginaw County, um, which is in kind of right over here. Um, so it's, it's, a big, it's a big area. Um, it contains all or parts of 22 counties, more than a, uh, about a million and a half people, some of the state's most important industries and richest farmland, and 7,000 miles of lakes and rivers. There's a of a blow up and we're about we're kind of right in there um, major sub watersheds um, as i said it's big our biggest sub watershed is the the titabawassee watershed um, but we also have the flint the cass uh Shiawassee, some other ones and just to give you a sense of the size this is the caw and pine watershed right here this is where i grew up i grew up on the caw and river right here um, and that's about 500 square miles. So, you know, the, the, the sub-watersheds of the Saginaw Bay watershed in and of themselves uh, are pretty massive. Um, just a, another graphic of the river systems. Um, you know, all of those rivers and waterways drain the Saginaw Bay. I know I'm preaching to the choir. You all know what a watershed is, but my point is this one's a big one. Um, and you also may or may not know that um, the Saginaw River and Saginaw Bay are one of the areas of concern, one of the 41 across the Great Lakes on both sides of the border. Um, and you'll probably also know that you can become an area of concern um, by having one or more uh, of a beneficial use impairment. And so we were listed in the area of concern in the early 1980s because we had a few of these. So we had restrictions on fish and wildlife consumption, uh, we had restrictions on dredging activities, and we had loss of fish and wildlife habitat. But we also have degradation of benthos, uh, tainting of fish and wildlife flavor, degradation of aesthetics, degradation of fish and wildlife population, uh, and if that weren't enough. Uh, we have drinking water restrictions or taste and odor problems, eutrophication or undesirable algae, uh, degradation of phytoplankton and zooplankton, bird or animal deformities or reproductive problems. Anybody want me to stop yet? Um, and then finally, beach closings. Um, yes, uh, we are the record holder for area of concern beneficial use impairments. Um, of the 14, we started with 12. Now we've been lucky enough, we've been able to remove a few of them, um, due in large part to, to a tremendous work that groups are, are doing across the watershed. Certainly the, the GLRI funding that's gone into a, a ton of projects here has been extraordinarily helpful. And so we've been able to remove tainting of fish and wildlife flavor, uh, drinking water restrictions, um, and loss of fish and wildlife habitat. Um, but really looking at those, those are, uh, those are kind of the low hanging fruit, all right? So we're working on the rest of them. Um, there's a, a map of the, uh, of the entire area of concern. So it's all of Saginaw Bay. 
and then the lower part of the Saginaw River. So um, if there's one thing that we've done really well around here in this blue collar community or the communities around here, um, it's been pollution. Um, but at the same time, it's given a lot of groups opportunities to do some really good stuff to fix it. And, uh, and certainly a lot of those groups are represented here today. Um, one of the things that we funded early on through our Saginaw Bay project was a measures of success document, um, which uh, addressed once you're on the BUI list, how do you get off it? There was never really any good direction to do that. And so our watershed was one of the first ones to kind of put together a roadmap on how to do that. Um, SaginawBayWind.org, um, these documents, um, you can find them on there. So our Saginaw Bay Watershed Initiative Project, and I'll just refer to it as WIN, um, is a, a really unique um, coalition of groups that has come together with a focus on sustainability. Um, it's a voluntary association. It's not a nonprofit. We operate it out of the Conservation Fund's office. Um, it's truly a network um, that focuses on um, areas such as land use and water resources, wildlife habitat, regional marketing, and agriculture. And it's really designed not to compete with groups that are out there, but to facilitate their work, um, looking at these indigenous groups that are working in, in trying to make them more effective. Um, Probably our claim to fame is that we have a, a coalition of 12 foundation and corporate partners that have come together that provide money to us every year that we then re-grant to projects. And so we funded um, over 300 projects to the tune of about $8 million, I think it has been, over the past 19 years. Um, I want to talk to you today about some of our key focus areas, education, access, and restoration. We're going to get into a lot of pictures here because I know you guys have been looking at uh, data and graphs and, and all of that fun stuff this morning, um, which is very important, um, but I thought you'd also like to see some things that are getting done on the ground here in the Saginaw Bay watershed. Um, just a few of the projects that, that we're funding right now um, that might have an interest to you, and hopefully you know, we can talk afterwards, and if some of these you know, spark some ideas and you want to take them back to your community, I can certainly uh, provide some information on how to do that. Um, Education has been big, um, education about our natural resources, because we know that if people don't understand our natural resources, they're not going to care for them. So um, providing funding for greenways and, and outreach materials for natural resource areas. Um, we funded a project a couple years ago, Sustainable Lands Partners. That's with the Little Forks Conservancy. We have a great network of land conservancies that work around the watershed here, and the Little Forks Conservancy is one of them. And that's, this is a project to work with um, willing landowners that may at some point in the future decide that they want to conserve their property. And so Little Forks Conservancy um, has set up what they call a registry system. And when you're on that registry, you get a little sign um, that you can put in front of your property. It lets you know that while you haven't conserved your land yet, in the future your plans are too. Um, green infrastructure mapping. Some of you have certainly been involved in green infrastructure mapping. We did um, the region's um, first green infrastructure map mapping exercise in three counties around the bay. Um, and this was really based off a project that was done in Florida. Um, and the project in Florida was one of the first green infrastructure projects done in the country that said, you know, if the endangered Florida panther wants to get from one side of the state to the other, how does it do that without getting hit on I-75 or walking through somebody's backyard? Because the last thing you want in your backyard is a panther. Um, and so we took that same logic and applied that to what we're doing here. And, and what we've done is looked at a, a non-motorized system because you know, people are critters too, and so we want to be able to get people throughout the watershed or throughout the counties on uh, non-motorized trails. Um, but we also want um, animals to, uh, to have connected habitats. And so we looked at areas of connectivity, and this project right now is being used by um, land conservancies and communities across the watershed, trying to determine where do we put new parkland, where do we put areas of new connected habitat. Um, watershed signage. Um, we believe pretty strongly, at least in our committees, that people are really interested in the Saginaw Bay watershed, but they're super interested in the watershed in which they live. So, you know, whether it's the, the Kaukauan watershed or whether it's the Cedar River watershed um, or the Chippewa River watershed, um, we did a series of road signage. I think we've signed seven sub watersheds so far. Um, and what these do, it's really kind of a it's really kind of passive education, right? So we have a sign here that says Saginaw Bay Watershed, called Cullen River, so these are on the borders of the watershed itself. Um, and so people build a relationship with where they live, but they also build that greater relationship with how they impact the entire Saginaw Bay Watershed. Um, Bay Sale, um, which has been a, a tremendous success story. If any of the, anybody here has been um, up in Northwest Michigan, the Inland Seas Project, where they own a schooner, 
um, that takes kids out on Grand Traverse Bay for watershed education and, uh, uh, and water quality testing. Um, we used that model and brought not one, but two schooners here to, uh, to Bay City. These are both um, docked on the Saginaw River. Um, so far, they've taken about 30,000 kids out on Saginaw Bay. Uh, and you'd be surprised, um, the, the communities of people and the communities and, and kids um, that live 15 miles from Saginaw Bay yet have never been out on it or never seen it. Um, it's, it's extraordinary to me, and that's only because, you know, I grew up on the bay. It, it's second nature to me, but um, getting people out to really experience this and going out with the kids, it's, you know, the first thing that's amazing is they look at it and they say, well, where's the other side? I mean, can't you see the other side of the lake? You know, it's a lake. Um, and truly, you can't, as you, uh, as you know. Um, access has been something else that we've really promoted here in the Saginaw Bay watershed, going back to that theme of getting people out there and, and, uh, and getting them on the water. Um, so we acquired property um, along the river that turns into parkland and non motorized trails. We provided opportunities for people uh, of all abilities to get out on rivers. I think that we've funded 10 um, all-access launches um, on, on some of our major rivers, and then additional um, launches themselves and trail systems. This is a trail that's being built out at Shiawassee National Wildlife Refuge. If you have time on your way home, if you're heading south, um, certainly stop by the, uh, the Shiawassee National Wildlife Refuge to see the fall migration, which is really kind of kicking in right now. Um, additional access projects, um, I think we've funded two dozen of these so far in various rivers. Um, these are kind of an interesting um, uh, system for paddlers and small boat launches. Um, these are integrated um, connecting concrete pieces that are, uh, that are built off-site and then assembled on-site, so it provides access at sites where you can't get heavy equipment in there. So um, really a, a novel solution to, uh, to access issues um, at some of our, uh, on, along some of our rivers. Um, additionally, this is a, an access site along um, uh, the Saginaw River in Essexville. This was kind of a, an abandoned park um, that a new city manager came in and was looking for some seed funding to help develop that park into a boat launch area and kayak launch um, and fishing area. Um, we often come in with grants. Um, we don't often fund an entire project, but we may come in with you know, kind of an average grant is fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. But usually, what that does is offset the community's local match, so they can apply for federal funds or state funds or other philanthropic dollars um, with some money already in their pocket. So what it really does is catalyze their efforts to get things done on the ground. Um, from a restoration perspective, um, and, and a lot of you have dealt with these, I know from, from looking at your agenda, um, dams, right? Um, we have 400 dams on the Saginaw River system. Um, some of them are big dams, like some of these on the Titabwasi system that are up on the upper Titabwasi and have tremendous lakes in the backwaters where they have tremendous houses and uh, very expensive houses. Um, those dams probably aren't going to go anywhere because people like their houses on those lakes um, and they would rather not have their house on a creek. Uh, but, you know, we have many opportunities to remove dams at some of these other rivers. And, and the reason that we're interested in removing dams, and a lot of these have been abandoned, a lot of them were built 150 years ago, um, the reason that we're interested in removing them is, is probably fourfold. Um, people access, fisheries access, safety issues, in just the fact that communities don't have um, dollars to tear them down themselves. And so we've been able to provide some early dollars uh, and reopen about 450 miles of river frontage. Um, the fisheries impact of that is huge. Um, we have a, a, a big walleye fishery out here on the bay. It's probably one of the top three walleye fishing destinations um, in the entire country. 90% um, of those fish spawn in this river, okay? actually the tail end of this river, the Titabwasi system. Um, what we're trying to do is build some resiliency in the system. So the more dams we can remove, the more fish that we have spawning in some of these um, other rivers. This is a, a kind of a topical slide for um, Lake Huron. This is put together by public sector consultants. Um, we decided really if we're gonna have an impact on water resources when we have you know, only so many dollars, where are we gonna have the most impact? And that's where dams kind of floated to the top. Um, but I, I love this graphic because this is this is then, so this is the Lake Huron Basin pre-settlement. This is Lake Huron Basin now, okay? And, and what, this, what this identifies is the habitat area that's available to fish. So pre-settlement, fish were spawning in all these rivers. Uh, Post-settlement, all these rivers are dammed, all right? So, so you can see why we sometimes have fish population issues is because they just simply can't get to where they used to go. Um, 
and, uh, and one of the fish that we've really targeted for restoration um, are sturgeon, and, uh, and sturgeon were all but extirpated in the, uh, in the Saginaw Bay watershed. So a few nice pictures of dams that have been removed. This is uh, Chesning on the, uh, on the Shiawassee River. This is one of the first dam removal projects that we were involved in. Um, Chesning has a showboat um, that's kept upstream, and so they needed to maintain the head of water. Um, and so this is a, a rapid system um, that passes fish and uh, uh, walleye and sturgeon, um, or proposed to pass sturgeon, it certainly passes walleye right now. And, and walleye are not trout. Um, they don't jump. I mean, walleye are pretty lazy. You know, if they come up and bump their you know, nose against a rock, they're going to turn around and go back downstream. Um, so we had to build these with that in mind, that we needed walleye to get through here to get up to some of their native spawning areas. Um, Mount Pleasant, um, which is where Central Michigan University is, not too far away, um, also had a dam at Mill Pond Park um, that we're able to provide some financing for them to remove, which reopened 13 miles um, of the Chippewa River. Uh, Vassar Dam, um, which is on the Cass River, this was removed in 2012. Um, Chiatown Dam, this is on the Shiawassee River near Owasso. Um, this was finally just removed this year. This is um, kind of the superstructure that was there after the first phase of removal took place. Um, safety issues are, are paramount. These abandoned dams, um, they're like magnets for kids, right? Um, kids like to walk out on these dams and check them out, and then they like to dive off them. Um, and, and sometimes um, that doesn't work out. Um, four kids died on this dam um, over the past couple of decades, and, uh, and finally, and it was an abandoned dam, um, and finally we were able to put the, uh, put the dollars together to get the thing out of there so, so you know, kids could enjoy the river again safely, um, fish could pass it, um, and now there's actually a, a kayak launch right here, so it, it turned into a really terrific project. This is the old backwaters up in here, so there was a lake up in here. Um, there's no longer a lake, um, but there's a great river for paddling. Frankenmuth, um, some of you might be familiar with, uh, with Michigan's little Bavaria, right? Uh, Frankenmuth. Um, this, is a, this is a dam in Frankenmuth uh, along the Cass River. Um, the removal of this dam reopened um, 70 miles of river, um, reconnected 70 miles of river. Um, it's not every day that you get to take big equipment out into, uh, out into a river and remove a dam. Um, and this is the final project. This was completed five years ago. Um, and again, this was a, a rapid system that was put in place because they needed to hold the water behind it. Um, Frankenmuth is Michigan's largest tourist attraction, if you can believe it. Um, and um, people love to go to Frankenmuth. There's lots of things to do. But there are some river boats. So there's a private, privately run riverboat system there, um, and if you just remove the dam, which I think in most cases we'd like to do, um, the riverboat system goes out of business. Um, and so we we're able to make arrangements for fish to both pass and kayaks and canoes to both pass um, while sa simultaneously keeping that head of water um, up where the, uh, the riverboats are. Uh, Cedar River Watershed, um, another one of our signed projects here. The Cedar River is a really small river kind of up in the northwest uh, portion of the watershed, but the thing that's really significant about it um, is it's the Saginaw River watershed's only blue ribbon trout stream. This is a, a generally a warm water system. We have this little pocket of cold water trout stream um, and blue ribbon at that, so it's a very significant trout stream. Um, and there was a dam on it. Um, people wondered why there were no trout up, upstream of, of these certain properties. Um, and I showed you the map earlier. This dam wasn't even on the map. Um, this was a, a dam that was built by a farmer years ago um, to help control water on their property. And we have a feeling that there are lots more of these dams. And so we worked with a great partner here on Pines um, to help remove that dam, provided some funding for them to make that happen. Um, and then they use that to leverage some GLRI funding and some additional funding as well. Sturgeon, everybody likes to talk about sturgeon. This has been pretty exciting around here. So I talked about dams and some of the restoration projects that we've done. Um, and a lot of them have been done with the assumption that someday, um, we'd try to bring sturgeon back. Um, and um, sturgeon are kind of that uh, highlight species um, that, uh, that we've been looking for. And you know, sturgeon are caught every now and then out in the Saginaw River um, or in, in commercial nets out in Saginaw Bay. But they're all big fish. They're all old fish. Um, there is no literature um, available that um, has record of anybody catching a juvenile sturgeon, a young sturgeon. So the sturgeon that are caught out there are 60, 70, 80 years old. Um, and we thought if we can remove some of these barriers to habitat, um, we can start 
um, restoring the sturgeon population. So with a broad partnership um, that included the DNR, um, the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Sea Grant, uh, Michigan State University, and some others, um, we were able to, uh, uh, to begin the reestablishment of the sturgeon population um, two years ago. These are numbers from 2018. Um, this year we planted uh, another thousand sturgeon in four rivers, the Flint, the Cass, the Shiawassee, and the Titabawassee. Um, people love sturgeon. You know, we have uh, put together some, some major events um, where we brought people out to the rivers to help us reintroduce sturgeon. Um, you know, people invariably say, wow, these sturgeon, they're like dinosaurs. And I said, you know, they're, they've been around for 130 million years. These are dinosaurs. You know, these are the real thing. And, uh, um, you know, they were there when the, the woolly mammoth was walking around campus out here. Or Tyrannosaurus rex was around. Um, and so, so how often do you get an opportunity to come out and, uh, and touch a real dinosaur? And uh, um, every event that we have, um, the, the public just shows up in droves, um, and they love it. We also have a new program, the uh, Sturgeon in the Classroom Project. Um, we have three classrooms um, in the Saginaw Bay watershed, uh, Western High School in Auburn, um, St. Lorenz in Frankenmuth, and um, a middle school in Saginaw Township, White Pine Middle School, that, are all, that all have sturgeon in the classroom. They adopt them, they keep them through, uh, uh, through the spring, and then, uh, and then release them um, near summer. So they're actually getting their sturgeon in a couple of weeks um, for the next round. There are only 15 sturgeon available for classrooms statewide, and we have three of them at schools here. This is a great picture. Um, thanks to, uh, to Michigan Sea Grant for, for capturing this. Um, we did a, a sturgeon event, uh, release event, um, in Flint, on the Flint River, and as you know, the Flint River has not gotten a lot of good publicity lately. Um, but this was a great opportunity to get people to the Flint River to release a threatened species um, into the Flint River. And, uh, and you might recognize this lady. This is Mayor Karen Weaver um, of the city of Flint um, that came down to help us release sturgeon. Um, it was, a, uh, it was a, a terrific day. Um, just some of the, the other materials that we put together to, to promote it. Um, you're probably not going to see it from there, but a huge partnership of organizations has come together to both support the sturgeon re restoration and, uh, uh, and show up at these events and, uh, and really promote them. Each one of these events on each of the four rivers has a, a local partner, usually a watershed organization um, that is taking the lead. Um, we also have a, uh, a Saginaw Bay Sturgeon Restoration website, um, so you can go there at uh, saginawbaysturgeon.org and learn more about the project. Um, and Megan Goss is out there, it's dark out there, where are you at Megan? There she is right there. So, so Megan is my partner in crime from Sea Grant on the Sturgeon Project, um, at least the, the, the local piece of it, and, uh, and helps us with the website. And she told me I couldn't come up here unless I could try to shake you down for, uh, for a t-shirt. These are available on the website. So if you're interested in a Saginaw Bay Sturgeon t-shirt. Um, but the really cool thing is, if you know Sturgeon, they have those scoots on the back. So you get the scoots on the back. So, uh, so go to, to, go to saginawbaysturgeon.org and you can order your own official shirt um, and, uh, and learn more about, uh, about that project. Um, I also want you to meet Blake Smith. So Blake is a 14 year old, was fishing in Zilwaukee through the ice on the Saginaw River last year uh, for walleye um, and pulled up a sturgeon. So the, the beauty of it is in this time, um, everybody has a cell phone with them with a the camera. And so, uh, so Blake's brother was able to take a picture of him. And what Blake didn't know is this is the first juvenile sturgeon ever caught on record in the Saginaw River system. Um, so this picture traveled around to all the researchers who looked at it under a microscope, and they said, you know what? That's one of our sturgeon that we released in 2018. And so um, a real success story. And subsequent to this, another juvenile sturgeon was caught um, on the Titabawassee River um, earlier this year. So, so some success. It's a, it's a big deal um, when you start seeing these sturgeon um, survive and thrive. Um, another project, a restoration project, Rifle River, which is a, a direct tributary of, uh, of Saginaw Bay um, near West Branch. Um, this, is, uh, this is a 500 acre um, part of Rose City. All of these catch basins from the street were installed in the 1950s. They all drain to Houghton Creek, which is a tributary of high quality Rifle River, um, and was the site of the record holding brown trout for the state of Michigan for about 60 years. Um, but, uh, but heavily polluted from, uh, from street runoff. Um, so a good partner of ours here on Pines um, raised some money from Saginaw Bay Wind, brought in some GLRI money, and put together a, uh, a grit, sand grit oil grease separator, um, which is now operating 
um, at that one outfall to, uh, uh, to Houghton Creek. And which is what's terrific about it um, is that you had the entire community and some state representatives show up for this ribbon cutting where you can't really even see what it is from where they're standing here. It's all underground, you know. So this was something that the city of Rose City, which is a very small village, um, wouldn't have been able to do without them, by themselves without some wind funding, without some technical support by the folks at Huron Pines um, who actually came in, leveraged some dollars, and got the project done, um, working to, uh, to provide a, a healthier and cleaner um, Flint River. I'm sorry, uh, Houghton Creek and Rifle River. Um, Whitney Drain and the Augury River, this was a, a drain, um, a river that was rerouted in the, uh, in the 30s um, uh, in hopes that it would drain farm fields faster. Of course, engineering in the 1930s is not what it is today, and so all of a sudden the river bank started to fall in over the next 80 years, um, and, uh, and it became one of the, uh, the largest contributors of sediment to Saginaw Bay, um, another great restoration project that was done um, by a, a tremendous group of partners um, eliminating this source of, of sedimentation for, uh, for Saginaw Bay. Really, there's some great information online about this and what a, a terrific project that was. Shiawassee Refuge restoration projects there are using, using hydrogeomorphic analysis. Um, 1,000 acre, one of the largest um, wetland restorations ever done in one fell swoop um, was done at the Shiawassee National Refuge. And I want to kind of close up with some work. Um, Brett and Joldersm is here. He has a, a session er later today about the spawning reef um, on Saginaw Bay, which was just completed a couple weeks ago. Um, some photos for, from that. Um, the, this is a, a major restoration project. Um, and just a, we're doing a documentary on it and just a real quick video. Twenty-seven thousand tons of aggregate. Um, about forty loads were taken out to uh, to Saginaw Bay. Don't tell anybody I showed you this video because uh, it's not for public display yet. Um, it'll be part of a documentary that'll be released in December. To see more about that project, go to uh, Breton's session um, later today and you can learn more. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on some other projects. Um, we do rain gardens. We funded rain gardens for schools. Um, right here at SBSU, there's a native planting site, local provenance plants. Um, it might be worth taking a walk out there and seeing it's one of the only local provenance sites um, in Michigan, and it's right here on the campus. Um, we funded a revolving fund for uh, the replacement of septic systems along certain rivers in the Saginaw Bay watershed. Um, we're evaluating fish passage. This is a, the first walleye that we know of that was caught above one of the dams that we removed, so we found out that it was working. Um, water management projects, um, and lots of other things. So we have a website at saginawbaywind.org um, that talks about all of these projects. Each one of these slides could have been its own presentation, obviously, um, and I'm glad to take any questions or, uh, uh, or, or answer any ideas or thoughts that you might have about what we're doing or anything else that's going on in the Saginaw Bay. So, Thank you very much for your attention. Test, test. Are there any questions? We have time for maybe one or two questions if folks have any while I make my way back up stage. Please come up to the microphones if you have a question. These folks are hungry. I'm really close, so I'm just going to say thank you very much for a positive and inspiring talk on what we can do. Yeah, there's a lot of really good examples in the Saginaw Bay watershed. As I mentioned earlier, there are a ton of groups. You know, I could never list all the groups that are working, um, but uh, uh, lots of opportunities for work and some really creative organizations that are doing some, uh, some fantastic things, so thank you. All right, just a, just a few housekeeping stuff. Thank you. you got Oh, is this a question? Sorry, go ahead. Is your ultimate goal to remove every dam in the watershed, or is there some kind of criteria that you use to decide whether they retain them or, or remove them? Yeah, we kind of um, have a hit list, so to speak. Um, you know, we're not going to go and, and remove dams, spend resources removing dams where it's just going to open up a, a muddy drain or a muddy ditch or something like that that's not going to provide for good habitats. And we're not going to remove dams where um, where there's a real social issue. You know, like I mentioned earlier, we're not going to remove a dam where it's going to uh, drain a, a two-square-mile lake either, um, where there are homes. But, you know, where there are opportunities and where communities have passion or issues related to a dam, um, that's kind of our sweet spot. But we do have a list. Um, we had uh, 
out of our top 10, I think we've removed eight of them. Um, there, there's a couple more that we have to do, a couple really good ones that we'd like to do. Um, a couple of them are privately owned, and so, uh, so that presents some issues. A lot of these that we've done, the majority of them have been publicly, publicly owned or abandoned to the public at some, in some fashion. So um, we're not going to remove all of them, but we're going to remove them kind of strategically. All right, let's thank our plenary speaker one more time. Thank you. Thank you. Buy a, buy a t-shirt, buy a t-shirt, go to the website. Great, just a um, few quick announcements. Um, I just wanted to thank the co-hosts uh, who you heard uh, from the Great Lakes Beach Association this morning. Um, so we really thank those that are here from the Beach Association. And I just want to thank the Council of the Great Lakes Region, who's also acting as a co-host. So we'll hear more from uh, Mark Fisher tomorrow. Um, in, in your program is also the list of sponsors who have contributed to offset the cost of this sponsor or of this conference. We really wanted to thank them as well, Environment and Climate Change Canada, the International Joint Commission, the US EPA, Limnotech, the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission, and the Saginaw Valley State University Saginaw Bay Environmental Studies Institute. Um, so please, please, if you see anyone with a name badge that has those names on it, thank them. This conference would not have been possible without their support. Um, don't, don't forget, tonight is the poster session. It's going to be in the banquet rooms, which we have not been to yet. It's on the other side of this building, up on the second floor. Uh, we'll, we'll direct you if you go past the registration table. Um, also, uh, after the poster session is our um, public meeting, which will take place in this room here. So make your way back uh, for that. And then tomorrow we have our um, movie night and also a pizza open bar and mini wrap up for, uh, for folks. There, there's also still room on the field trips for Friday. If anyone still wants to sign up, please stop at the registration table. And most importantly, lunch. Your lunch tickets are in your name badge and just follow the crowd that way. Did I miss any, any important announcements? Anybody? Good? All right. Thank you. And we're reconvening back at 2 p.m., so about an hour or so for lunch. I'm Sherry Falk, I'm president of Friends of the Tanker River. Oh, yeah, I'm here.